Tough guy Charles Bronson grew up in hopeless poverty as he worked mines at 16 to support his family. Little did he know he'll end up as a big TV star. But away from TV, Charles's life was nothing like anyone could have imagined. His daughter finally confirmed the rumors and speculations. Charles was a violent man who once choked a director on set and left him gasping for his life. But why was Charles Bronson so violent? Did he have a heart? Join us as we explore the shocking truth about the life of Charles Bronson, revealed by his daughter. Early beginning of extreme poverty. It is said that you are most influenced by your early environment. Charles Bronson had it rough while growing up. That must have been why he built the tough guy persona. Bronson, whose real name is Charles Dennis Buczynski, was born on November 3, 1921, into extreme poverty in Ehrenfeld, Pennsylvania, a coal mining town in Pennsylvania's Allegheny Mountains. He was the 11th child out of 15 born to immigrant parents who came from Lithuania. His father died from working in the mines and inhaling toxic substances when he was only 10, leaving his mother with 15 children. Their standard of living went from bad to worse. They struggled to eat. Charles had to survive. When he was six years old, his family could not afford new clothes for him, so he had to wear a dress that had been used and given to him by one of his older sisters. The dress may not be new, but he got a change for once. You can imagine the level of poverty. When Bronson was 16, he had to work in the mines to help his family. He earned one dollar for each ton of coal that he mined. The mines were already dangerous for a 16-year-old, and then he had to work like a slave. He and his brother worked in extremely unsafe conditions, removing stumps between mines and cave-ins. But Bronson was a survivor. When he looked back at those years, he knew that was something no child should ever go through. Bronson also had a daily reminder of his painful memories. His hard hands and scars on his legs and torso from working in the mines. His body began to respond to the impact of the dark and toxic environment he worked to make ends meet. Bronson had to deal with regular headaches and the fear of tight spaces. I can still smell the coal in my nose, he would say, any time he had an opportunity to talk about his early life. In 1943, Charles was enlisted in the United States Army Air Forces during World War II. Then he went on to become an actor. When people noticed that popular actor Charles Bronson was in the Army during World War II, horrible stories started flying around. One said he was a tail gunner in the war, and Bronson was not interested in correcting anyone's opinion. However, a journalist who longed for the truth found out that Charles was assigned to the 760th Mess Squadron in Kingman, Arizona, and he lived a simple life. He spent his war days driving a delivery truck. After the war, Charles did a lot of things to make ends meet. He worked as a bricklayer, a short order cook, and even picked onions in New York. Then he moved to Atlantic City where he rented beach chairs on the boardwalk. And just like a movie, the universe stepped in. One day, when doing his business of renting chairs, he met some actors who were vacationing in the city. He talked to them about his painting skills and convinced them to let him work on their stage set. The actors were impressed, so they hired him and even gave him a little role in their movie. As Bronson worked on their stage sets, he discovered something he could not believe. He loved painting, but he was the happiest when he was acting. In 1949, Charles decided that it was time for a fresh start, so he packed his bag and moved to California. He quickly took acting lessons at the Pasadena Playhouse. While he was there, the 27-year-old fell for Harriet Tendler, an aspiring actress, and they were declared married that same year. After a few years in California, he landed his first minor role in You're in the Navy Now, which starred Gary Cooper. He played different characters in other movies, tough guys, builders, and even the annoying bodyguard trying to prevent the main character from getting to the villain. Like any other immigrant family story, Bronson found himself in the background. He was not getting the recognition he deserved, neither was he getting the pay. Bronson soon found out that was not the one anyone wanted to be the face of American TV. He still had a hunch of his accent, and he once joked that his voice sounded like a quarry. When Bronson first started acting, he went by his birth name, Buczynski. But in 1954, he started a film called Drumbeat, and that was when he became Charles Bronson. But why did he need to change his name? At that time, Russia and the United States were far from being allies, 
and Bronson feared the anti-communist crusade, then being conducted by Senator Joseph R. McCarthy. Since he was under public scrutiny, he thought it was not wise to have a Russian-sounding last name. The name Charles Bronson, which would soon become a household name in Hollywood, was easier to pronounce. In the early 1950s, Charles did not have a good number of big-budget films under his belt. All he got was a series of low-budget features. After changing his name, he continued starring in low-budget films. One notable mention was Machine Gun Kelly, which was filmed in eight days with a ridiculously low budget. Some years later, a popular French actor, Alain Delon, saw the movie and enjoyed it. He invited Mr. Bronson to France, where he starred in another movie called Adieu L'Ami. The movie was an instant hit across Europe in the 1970s. It became Mr. Bronson's first major blow. But in the coming years, Charles would be a persona that would become a household sentiment. Why was playing the tough guy role in Hollywood so important to him? Maybe it could have something to do with his background, or not. Tough guy role. Before we explore the shocking revelation by his daughter, let's look at one of Bronson's notable films, which was eerily similar to his normal life. In 1963, Charles played flight lieutenant and tunnel king Danny Walensky in a movie called The Great Escape. Walensky dug tunnels to escape prisoner of war camps, even when it left a bitter taste in his mouth. He already had a phobia for tight places, but Bronson looked past his painful memories of digging up the ground and serving during World War II. He acted in the film anyway. You would think Charles did not have a heart, but did you know that Bronson loved like a normal human? Bronson's violent streak. Although Charles played the tough guy role, he was still human. Filming violent scenes and getting to relive his labor as a child drained him physically and mentally, but he continues his tough guy stint in Hollywood. While filming The Great Escape, Charles fell for another beautiful British actress called Jill Ireland. At that time, Jill was married to David McCallum. On one occasion, Bronson had joked with McCallum about marrying his wife. The men laughed it off at that time, but it turned out to be more than just a joke. Bronson's first marriage with Harriet was already falling apart. The cracks had become so wide that they were visible to an outsider. They eventually called it quits in 1965, and then Bronson went on to marry Ireland. When Bronson married Ireland in 1968, he had gradually become a household name. Film critics agreed that even when the scripts were badly written or the film was low budget, Bronson would always deliver a great performance. Among his credits by this time were The Magnificent Seven, 1960, and The Great Escape, 1963. Fans were going crazy about the tough guy on the block. He had garnered a loyal following in France, Japan, and Italy. He was known in Italy as Il Bruto, meaning the ugly one. But his wife, Jill, knew that behind the serious tough guy, Wal Bronson carried everywhere he went, was a mysterious tenderness that she had experienced. She supported him all the way. Bronson was not just the tough guy on your TV screen. He also carried a strong attitude when he was dealing with other people. Some opined that his face held untold stories of rough beginnings. Others just thought he was outrightly violent. But Bronson also had his demons in his past. When he was younger, he would always threaten other people. He once went as far as breaking a sergeant's arm in an altercation. When he got older, he had displayed some violent acts on set. He once choked a director and left him gasping for air after an argument about a scene. Many people were so obsessed with the violent tag that even Michael Gordon Peterson, Britain's most notorious British prisoner, used it as an alias when he needed a new name in 1987. The name Charles Bronson carried a whiff of violence. Some people feared the man. One time when Bronson was still fresh in his acting career, Esquire magazine quoted him saying that he would take down anyone who tried to harm his family at any time. He was automatically labeled as very violent. We know for a fact that every family man would not sit down and look while someone is hurting his family. But Charles was a public figure now, so everyone had an opinion. Famous TV host Johnny Carson invited Bronson to his show and asked him about the Esquire quote. Many would have thought Bronson would change his statement or even accuse the magazine of lying, but he stood his ground, simply saying, that's what I said. So he took some getting used to in the United States especially with the press. 
Bronson did not hide the fact that he did not like the press. He thought they were very manipulative and always tried to get information about his personal life. Film critics were no different, and he made sure they knew that he did not like them one bit. When critics complained, Bronson replied, we don't make movies for critics since they don't pay to see them anyhow. Roger Ebert, a popular film critic, once interviewed Charles Bronson. Roger said he saw something intense in the eyes of the actor that made him believe that he had the capacity for violence. Bronson was not a pretender. If he did not like you, he would not hold back his hostility, whether you are his boss or not. He was once hostile to Nicholas Gessner, the director of a film they both worked on, and Charles did not hold back. He publicly chided Gessner and his works, even joking about giving him a good handshake after their time together. Bronson had a quick temper. It was easy for him to flare up. His wife, Ireland, knew about his hostile dealings with other people, but she laughed it off when she was asked about it on a TV show. Maybe the press was not cooking up stories about Charles Bronson, but how bad was it? Let's look at some of his most violent behaviors away from the TV. The Man with Nine Lives Bronson was always clashing with film directors. According to him, they were very difficult to work with. It was their stories, but it was his life. Charles was not happy with the roles they gave him. Perhaps he wanted a little more violence. Bronson called the film directors Hollywood nonsense. He harbored resentment for everyone who publicly disagreed with him. He was known for having altercations on set. Every director had their particular Bronson story to tell. Director of Telefon Don Siegel said while they were shooting the movie, co-star Lee Remick was afraid of touching Charles's face in a scene because she thought he might bite her. Another director, Walter Hill, directed the 1975 movie Hard Times. The film starred Charles Bronson, who played a brave fighter alongside his wife, Jill Ireland. Hill said that Bronson's physique was magnificent for the role, but they almost had an altercation over editing Ireland scenes in the movie. In 1991, Sean Penn, the director of The Indian Runner, revealed a little bit about the kind of character Bronson loved to play. Since he was known as the tough guy who probably had nine lives, he did not want his character to die in the film. He had to stay alive for his Italian fans. The producer for City Slickers, Billy Crystal, also recounted his encounter with Charles Bronson after he sent him the script for the movie, hoping to work with him. According to Billy, Charles called him angrily after going through the script. He cursed Crystal out, asking him why he would die on page 53. Bronson said, nobody kills Charles Bronson. Didn't you see my Death Wish movies? I don't die. Crystal said he tried to talk to him about the significance of the movie and why Bronson's character had to die. He was not sure if the tough guy was even listening because Charles cursed him out again and hung up the phone. He talked about Death Wish again. Why did Charles Bronson glory in his Death Wish character despite the controversies? Desiring violent roles like Death Wish, the director of Death Wish, Michael Winner, who had carefully articulated violent scenes for the movie, thought Bronson was a perfect fit. The story was about an architect turned vigilante who sought revenge, hunting muggers in New York after his wife was murdered and his daughter was assaulted. The Winner thought tough guy Charles could play the violent role without a struggle, but that was not the controversy. Charles played his character alongside a scary young man named Jeff Goldblum, now, Charles had never been one to chicken out, had he? Before Brobson took the part, big names in Hollywood like Clint Eastwood, Frank Sinatra, and Henry Fonda had all turned down the main character role. They all agreed that it was a horrifying role to give anybody. But Bronson was different. When he was called to take the role, it seemed like he was thrilled. He was down and ready. I'd like to do it, he said. In a bid to make sure he understood that it was just a film, Winner asked Bronson if he was talking about the movie, and Bronson replied, Nope, I'd like to shoot muggers. The film seemed like a twisted and despicable story, so the ease at which Bronson took the role was not a good look. People started doubting his mental health. Perhaps he had shot a mugger, who knew? Although Paul Koner knew when Bronson decided to accept the role, he cautioned Bronson about the strings of controversies it would bring to his name. He also warned the actor that the film was already sending the wrong message to the public. Was that something he wanted to be at the forefront of? But Bronson's logic was creepy. 
He asked Paul why the muggers would hurt his play family if they were aware of the consequences. According to Bronson, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. He carried that mantle everywhere. In July of 1974, Death Wish hit the theaters and it blew up. The movie hit a whopping $22 million at the box office. After it only cost about $3 million to make, it was huge. The winner managed to get everybody's attention, despite the heavy criticism surrounding the movie. Maybe the critics paid to watch the movie this time. Vincent Canby, reviewing it for the New York Times, called it a despicable movie, one that raises complex questions to offer bigoted, frivolous, oversimplified answers. The Death Wish story was derived from a book written by Brian Garfield in 1972. Garfield was not happy about the intense violence in the movie. More importantly, Garfield hated that Winner decided to feature Bronson, who was already known for violence. Once you saw Bronson, you already knew that he was going to start shooting up the place, Garfield said. He was not a happy man at that time. The writer originally wanted seasoned director Sidney Lumet to direct the movie, with Jack Lemmon as the lead actor. And Winner did not hold back. How do the fans imagine Lemmon as a vigilante that shoots? He knew Garfield wanted his book to be less violent, according to how he wrote it, but he also knew that the kindness was not going to sell. According to the winner, Garfield's book had only sold three copies before the movie, and he was sure that his mom and two relatives bought it to support him. Come on, Garfield, do you think you were writing about a fairy tale? Do you want kindness? The story was about a man going around killing people in a revenge spree, he said, who knew that Michael Winner could be so blunt. Well, if you watch Death Wish, you would not be surprised. After the success of the first Death Wish movie, Winner could not stop creating sequels. It became like a drug. A little dose of violence, exactly what Charles Bronson liked. Charles was on the same page with Winner because he played the lead role a whopping five times. Yes, Winner had created five sequels already. He made sequels in 1974, 1982, 1985, 1987, and in 1994. Maybe the knack for violence had ended, or Bronson was simply getting old. Garfield resented the sequels, as they were not the original plan of the book. He thought that Winner was trying to promote Bronson's violent acting, which he thought was average. These movies were constantly shown on TV and in the cinemas. Remember, children could easily watch them thinking an eye for an eye was the normal rule. Who knows? The movie might have contributed to the 20th century being one of the deadliest in history. It's simple logic. A constant dose of death wish only caused trouble. In 1984, a young man named Bernhard Gutz shot four young black men on a New York City train. It quickly earned him a nickname, the New York Vigilante, referencing Charles Bronson's role in Death Wish. When Winner was asked about the incident, he made a cryptic statement. He said, hey, I don't approve of what that guy did. But if Mr. Goetz was going to shoot someone on the subway, why not when we're opening? Ridiculous and a very dry joke. People were grieving. But that was not the end. More recently, the former president of the United States, Donald Trump, referenced the death wish in one of his rallies when he first decided to run for president. He told the crowd that he had gotten a handgun permit and he always carried his clip anywhere he went. According to him, if anyone attacked him, he was going to shoot them without missing a beat. Bizarrely, the crowd started chanting Bronson's name. Trump supporters were fully pro-death wish like their leader. Bronson enjoyed carrying a gun. He did not miss anywhere there was violence, did he? When Bronson was getting old, he knew he could not deal with all the extreme stunts again. So after the final Death Wish sequel, he stopped the vigilante movies. The tough guy settled into doing TV shows like Family of Cops. As you know it, he was plastered on the front cover, carrying a shiny pistol. Bronson and guns. He was a tough guy in most of his movies. He enjoyed carrying out his thoughts rather than saying them. Sometimes he did both. Like his persona on TV, Bronson was a quiet guy. He talked less and he did more. Everyone had an opinion as he got more famous, but do we know everything? Bronson was so influential that they had to make a movie about his life. In 1990, his beautiful wife, Jill Ireland, passed away after a long battle with cancer. But before she died, she had written about her experience with Bronson. That was what was used in the film, 
Jill Clayburgh played Ireland in the movie and Lance Henriksen played Bronson. It was like a tribute to Bronson and his wife. But there was another twist. Charles was not happy about the tribute and he took every opportunity to show it. He threatened to take the filmmakers to court as he had not consented. But why did Charles hide this part of himself from the public? Or was it that people would finally see the vulnerable man behind the vigilante persona? The other side of Charles Bronson, nobody knew. Charles actively contributed to stirring up rumors about being violent. He often told wild stories about violent escapades which made people believe that he could be harmful off camera. He told interviewers that he had been in fistfights and had been arrested on charges of assault and battery, and he liked to suggest to journalists and reporters that his hobby was knife throwing. But after some digging, reporters found out that his wild stories did not check out. They found no police record, no assault, and battery, and no predisposition toward violence. Why did Charles Bronson deem it extremely important to tell lies to keep up his tough image? In a surprising turn of events, the reporters found out that Mr. Bronson's hobby was painting and that he was a quiet and gentle man. But people still believed that Charles was an arrogant man. He had a weird habit. He hated shaking people's hands. It seemed like a proud move, but there was a story behind it. A story that you would never put in the same box with Charles if you watched his movies. Bronson was very afraid of getting sick, so he avoided shaking other individuals because of germs. He was also afraid of fire. Weird, right? He probably never entered the kitchen to cook anything. His fear of fire might have emanated from working in the coal mines when he was younger. When he was filming Death Wish in 1974, Bronson made sure they stayed in rooms no higher than the second floor. He did that so that all the cast and crew of Death Wish could jump or run to safety if there was a fire. Oh, he cared? Yes, Brunson was human despite getting angry when he was not given roles with nine lives. He probably feared death too, who knows? The real Brunson loved to talk about paintings rather than his altercations with different directors. You would have seen it in his interviews if you followed them carefully. Charles sold his paintings under his birth name, Charles Dennis Bukinski. He wanted people to know the real value of his paintings and not buy them because his alias Bronson was famous. Despite keeping his identity a secret, his paintings sold well in many galleries. It was one of the few things he was proud of. Even if Bronson wanted to sail his tough guy image on TV, he was very sensitive. Let's talk about Brobson's relationship with the young Kurt Russell. The young lad was only 12 years old when he met Charles, and when he knew about Bronson's birthday, Kurt decided to surprise him. The young lad bought him a remote-controlled airplane and was a bit scared of how Charles would react. But the actor's reaction was nothing like anyone ever expected. Charles was not a talker, but he showed that he appreciated the kind gesture. When it was Russell's birthday, Charles got him a top-of-the-line skateboard in the studio. Russell, who was so excited, decided to try it out immediately, but he was stopped by a security guard. When Charles saw what had happened, he went straight to the movie director along with Russell and reported himself. We are both going to be skating around the lot, he said. Maybe Charles was not all that bad. He was just someone that created a defense mechanism to help him cope with what he had to go through when he was younger and what he went through after the loss of his wife. In 1998, Bronson married Kim Weeks, a younger actress working for Dove Audio at that time. She stayed with him with all his health challenges till he took his last breath. When his health took a turn for the worse, he decided to quit acting. He died in 2003 at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. He was only 81 years old and had struggled with breathing problems for a while. Bronson is survived by his wife, Kim, three daughters, Suzanne, Katrina Holden Bronson, and Zulieka, all of Los Angeles, and a son, Tony of Los Angeles. He also had two stepsons, Paul and Valentine McCallum from Ireland. Recently, Katrina Bronson made an unbelievable revelation that nobody would have imagined. She was not the biological daughter of Charles Bronson. She was adopted. She took advantage of her father's resources and is currently a film director. Charles was worth about $75 million. He was smart with his money. Thanks for watching. Make sure you share what you think about the video in the comment section. Also, like and subscribe for more videos.